It's no secret that I'm a fan of the Shin Megami Tensei games, specifically the Persona series. Well, one of those kind of secrets, I guess, but... I've played this game once before, back when it was under the publication of Area Games, but I found it so utterly confusing that I wasn't able to really enjoy myself. However, news came about that the game was changing publisher to Atlas, who owns the Shin Megami Tensei series, so this seemed like a natural turn of events. And news of this game moving made me think that maybe I should get to it. This is the MMO Grinder, and it's time to look at Shin Megami Tensei Imagine. Developed by Cave and published by Atlas Online, Shin Megami Tensei Imagine, aka SMT Imagine, Mega Ten Online, what have you, is a 3D MMORPG based on the Shin Megami Tensei universe, specifically taking place between SMT 1 and 2. The overall story of the Shin Megami Tensei games is that demons have begun to dwell on Earth, and humans are beginning to interact with them through various means, like in this game using an arm-mounted piece of technology to summon them, or in the popular spin-off series Persona, evoking them as facets of their own psyche. Despite taking place in the same universe, these games are notorious for having tough but varying levels of difficulty, with games like Nocturne being considered among the hardest, and games like Persona being a bit more Like Baby's First SMT. Hey, I wouldn't go that far. Persona got pretty rough. Have you even played Nocturne? <laughs> Did you forget about Demi Kids? Well, I was trying to. There's quite a bit of history to the Shin Megami Tensei series, so feel free to look it up for yourself. As for this game, let's get started. While very fitting of the SMT universe, you can easily tell these graphics are pretty dated. Textures are pretty low res, and characters maintain a certain level of blockiness. It looks like the whole thing would have been playable on the PS2. Think of them as retro, I suppose. Alternatively, I love some of the demon designs, and there are many varieties to them. There's something hypnotic about the way the Inugami floats around itself. A lot of fun in the game can be had just looking around at each of the demons available. Until they start attacking you, of course. The dungeons have a very simple, repetitive, and blocky design to them as well. They're really nothing special to look at. On the plus side to all this, the game isn't difficult to run in the least, so you'll at least have that going for you. Many people will tell you that the soundtrack to SMT games is pretty good. While I could say that here, I could also say the other things that I hear about the SMT soundtracks. It gets repetitive. The first area you come to, Suganami, has a short track that just loops over and over with a very distinct set of notes that will really start to grate on you. You're listening to it right now. While the battle music is better, and a very jarring change from the map track, this also can get repetitive as it will restart every time you enter combat. An upgrade to the game changed the tracks to the battle music and the boss music, so it more closely matches the original SNES Shin Megami Tensei title, but I'm honestly a much bigger fan of the original battle theme. There seems to be a pretty divided base on which track is more preferred, but the original can still be found in the game from time to time. Sound is pretty simple, nothing really of note here, and I don't have anything to note about it. It's not realistic or goofy, it's just kinda there. Once you've signed up for Atlas Online, getting started is pretty simple. As a quick side note to those who are going to ask, if you did happen to have an account with Area beforehand and you haven't changed it over yet, from what I've been told that boat has sailed. Sorry to be the one to tell you that. Unless you didn't get that far in the first place. Like, uh, I did. I'm pretty sure I never initially got past level 10. You've got one server to choose from, Cerberus, so unless another is added sometime soon, this is it. At the very least, you can be sure you're playing on the same server as your friends. Speaking of only having one choice, you can create only one character. As you might have guessed, additional character slots are a cash shop investment. The character creator is pretty limited, too, giving you a choice of a few hair and clothing items in various colors. Once you're ready, you're taken to what I'd like to call the introductory level. It's not really a tutorial, and you'll learn very little about the game besides the very basic controls here. You can choose to skip this when prompted, but when you're ready, talk to the Demon Buster to start it. The controls are going to feel painfully awkward to you if you're coming from another MMO. While the movement is the standard WASD, A and D only turn your character, and you can't use Q and E to strafe. The buttons do nothing. You can choose to click the move alternatively, but again, the same issue with Fiesta applies, as targeting enemies might cause you to run towards them instead. 
Also, turning the camera doesn't steer your character unless you tap W to center your character. Like I said, awkward. Secondly, the combat is very, very slow. Almost turn-based in the manner it works. First, you need to target your enemy. Next, you need to click on the attack you want. Depending on that attack, it might have a charge time where it won't work until you've gone through some sort of small animation, usually an aura of some sort. This is especially true when casting spells or special attacks like Rush. After the charge, click the enemy, or click the skill again, if they're already targeted, to attack it. Then, of course, there's the counter and defense systems. Successful combat hinges entirely upon timing, choosing the right attacks or defenses at the right time, and even exploiting enemy weaknesses. Oddly enough, this combat system works a lot like Mobi Nogi if you've ever played that. A major fault I see is the game tells you very little, and doesn't do all that well explaining a lot of the game's nuances. After the intro level, you're taken to an area where you're immediately asked to venture outside. As you leave that room, you get a large message popping up telling you to talk to the guard before you leave. Since it pops up as you're leaving, it's pretty confusing and makes you think that you might need to go back into the room you just came from. Nope, the game's talking about the very nondescript NPC standing a few feet outside that door. Miss talking to this guy, and you lock yourself out of the real tutorial level, Virtual Battle, as he starts a small chain of quests that will eventually lead you there. If you try to enter Virtual Battle any other time, you'll get a baffling message that says it's down for maintenance. Do not miss Virtual Battle, or you will be completely lost in this game. This is where the game will explain a lot of its more confusing battle quirks. You'll be taken to a mini area where you'll be given a set of tasks, and, and if you want to understand the game's mechanics, do not just glance over the quest text. By the end of the tutorial, you'll learn about the more tricky points in the game, like assigning expertise, casting magic, and special attacks. There's a lot of complexity to this, and essentially boils down to how you want to build your character, as every option is available to you, but you're limited to what you can learn, so you'll need to decide how you want to progress yourself up front. This is done through the Expertise system I previously mentioned. Open the Personal menu and select Expertise. In here you'll find a massive list of available skills, along with others that aren't available yet. If you want to be attack damage focused, click on the small gray box next to the skill to change it to a red triangle. This means you will now gain expertise in that skill. Gaining points in here will fill up the progress bar for that skill when you use it. Reach a certain few ranks and you'll have the ability to learn better passive skills and new action skills as well. For example, leveling basic attack will grant you the ability to boost the damage power of your attacks, and leveling destruction magic will let you learn new magic spells. As you can imagine, this will take a long time, and the unfortunate aspect of this is that you will need to grind in order to make them more effective. With each level up, you gain a few points to boost your base stats to customize your playstyle. You can place points into strength, magic, vitality, intelligence, speed, and luck. While strength and magic do what you'd expect, vitality increases your hit points and your defense, intelligence boosts your support skill effectiveness, max MP, and magic defense, and speed is purely used to increase your damage with ranged weapons. It'll have no effect on how fast you move in general. Luck increases your critical hit chance, lowers the chance you'll be hit with criticals, and gives you a chance to survive from hits that would normally kill you, and the best part, increase the chance that you'll find really good loot from enemies. There's a lot of quirks to this game, and sadly, the best way to find them out is to ask others or discover them for yourself. Don't even remotely expect to just sail through this game. A really good way to grind, and perhaps the only effective way if you're looking to gain levels, is to do dungeon runs. The first, and sadly, only dungeon I was able to access when playing this game was Suganami Tunnels, but from what I've been told, all dungeons follow a very similar layout, just with different background textures. I'll get more into how dungeons work in Community, despite some being easily soloed if you know what you're doing. The reason they can be so easily soloed is both the main draw of this game, and the main crux of the Shin Megami Tensai series, the fact that you can recruit demons to bring along with you. It's a pretty complex system in that you'll need to recruit new demons, keep up their own levels and their skills, as well as maintain their attitude towards you. Doing this will not only make them more effective in battle, but they'll even occasionally grant you items or give you simple quests to perform. Recruiting a demon involves using three skill commands, Talk, Threaten, and Taunt. Usually you use only one of the three commands three times, and if the demon is recruitable, they will either flee, grant you an item, or offer to join you, in which you can accept by clicking the green egg that drops if they do. If you use the wrong commands, or if you're just too low level, the demon will simply attack or ignore you. Demons are scattered everywhere, and sometimes you'll even find special demons that will only appear in small areas at certain times of the in-game day. If there's a particular demon you have your eye on and suddenly it's not there, you may have to wait for the appropriate time before you can try again. A good tool to keep an eye out for is the circle next to the demon name. If it's red, you cannot recruit them at all, or at least at your current level. And if it's blue, you have a chance to get them to respond somehow. Just remember that 3 is the magic number. 
I can't count the number of times I've seen people running around trying over and over after three attempts. If you get no desirable response after three, it's probably just ignoring you. You can also obtain more demons through demon fusion, the simplest being double fusion, where you can combine two of your demons to create a new one. There are many different combinations to try, and one quest even has you specifically recruit two lower level demons to create a new one. The tutorial quest will let you get a pixie, with a moral choice of being able to keep it or give it over to the NPC so it can be surgically dissected. This affects your alignment meter, and there are a few times a choice like this will come about. Of course, you'll also receive a new demon for that quest as well, the Wounded Cerberus, who is an excellent starter demon despite not being further trainable. In SMT, as it's always been, demons come in many shapes, types, and sizes. They consist of mythological creatures from all over the globe, ancient deities, and even the occasional Lovecraftian horror. Some of them can look large and brutal, and tower over the players that control them. So naturally, I chose the Gongoro Pixie in the White Shongsam, who blows kisses and throws fireballs. Is that because the angel in bondage gear wouldn't contract with you? Of course it was! You can take direct control of your demon by pressing tab, allowing you access to their skills, and if you find your demon is a more effective fighter than yourself, you can easily use it to fight instead of you. Alternatively, it'll act on its own accord, but you can choose to designate how it works by turning off or on skills like healing or close range attacks in the demon menu. One thing I could not figure out when first playing this game was how to bring a dead demon back to life, so I'll tell you now and save you the hassle I went through. There's a pretty common healing item called a Revival Orb, which inexplicably looks like a runic stone donut. Double-click the item in your inventory when your character will glow with a white aura. After this happens, target the dead demon, and the targeting reticle should turn red. Click it, and it'll be brought back to life. Would've been nice if the game had mentioned that to me at least once. Speaking of death, when you die, if you are unable to be revived by another player, which you must grant permission to before it's possible, or use a cash shop item that allows you to come back to life immediately, you'll be ported back to whichever home point you've set up. Unless you're in a dungeon where you can just try the same floor again. You'll also lose a small percentage of your experience with each death. Reach level 10, you'll finally have access to the beginner zone where you can find a bunch of simple tasks for extra money and experience. I tell you this because the quest system in this game is painfully wonky. There's no real indicators that a certain NPC will have a quest for you, although I suspect the pluses on the minimap will show you some quest NPCs, just not all of them. To take a quest, see if they have the Ask About Work option in their dialogue tree, as that seems to be the most common phrase used for quests. Turning them in is almost as confusing, as you pretty much have to go through the exact same conversation tree in order to do so. Try to remember what you said to the NPC in order to get the credit for it. While some quests are simply tasks to get more experience, there's a main quest line that tracks your progress throughout the game. You can track your progress in both types of quests by clicking the quest option on the interface. While the system does give you the map coordinates for where you can find your task, it won't mark it for you at all. Okay, since I've managed to mention home points twice now without actually explaining them, now's the time. A home point is a large pillar that you can bind to for two purposes. The first being a point that you can choose to respawn upon death, and the second being fast travel you can reach with an item called a Triesto Stone. Traveling in the game takes a good while, but you can recruit certain demons and then buy an item that will allow you to ride them as mounts. The inventory and loot system is pretty basic. When you kill an enemy, you might notice an icon of coins appear next to their name. Click on the body and open the loot window, and you can choose individual items or take all. A lot of the items you'll find will be materials for crafting, but there's also quite a bit you can sell if you need to make the money. Money in the game is called Maka, and it takes up an inventory slot, but thankfully stacks without issue. There are other types of currency, Magnetite and AC, or Atlas Crowns. Magnetite is used to summon your demons from the demon list, and AC are the cash shop points. The inventory can get extremely cluttered, and sometimes the same types of items won't automatically stack. But luckily, there is a very easy way to fix this by clicking on the Collate button on the inventory box, and this will stack up anything that's been spread out. The final thing you'll want to know is to make sure you grab as much healing items as monetarily possible. While the Wounded Cerberus has a very useful group heal, you'll still need some backup healing, and many demons early on can hit very hard. It's very easy to die. Stock up on the individual and group heals, and don't forget to nab a few revival orbs as well. This is a very difficult game, both to play and to understand, so you might need the other people around you to help you with the basics until you've grasped what's going on. So, let's take a look into that aspect. The first thing you'll probably notice about this game is that the people are very chatty. Unfortunately, they may end up arguing with each other, or more often speak in terms that won't make a lick of sense to you. This game also seems to have a very niche audience, consisting mostly of SMT fans, anime fans, and people who just like the game as a game. 
I mentioned this before, but dungeon runs are the main source of getting levels and XP in this game. In order to enter a dungeon, you need a card, and the level of the card, bronze, silver, or gold, denotes a difficulty. You can purchase them, or some demons even drop them, but it's mildly rare. To enter a dungeon, head into the dungeon area and you can choose to start it in there, as well as party up with anyone else that might be running it. Once inside, it's a pretty standard layout of heading from room to room and clearing them out of enemies. Occasionally, at least in the Suganami tunnels, the only dungeon I reached, you'll find a locked door that requires a couple glittering ores, or occasionally three, which the enemies will drop. Eventually, you'll reach the boss room, which starts a cutscene. Clear out the room and defeat the boss. Once defeated, it'll drop several treasure boxes. You can only open one of them. They usually contain crafting items or stuff to sell, but you occasionally will find a really good piece of equipment in there. After that, you can choose to instantly exit by stepping into the beam of light that appears. Since you will probably need to run these a few times, I have to warn you about something. I mentioned the glittering ores being used as keys, and it's quite possible to have one drop and never end up using it. If you still have one in your inventory when you try to go into the dungeon again, it won't let you, and you'll get a message that mentions this. Just open your inventory and look for the ores, they look like small green plus signs, and discard them, and you can enter without issue, as long as you have another card. The main hub of the community, at least at the start of the game, is Home 3, a shelter that was created after the Demon Apocalypse. Here's where you'll find a lot of the shops and the place where you can perform Demon Fusion, and even sell items to other players using the Bazaar option. You might notice some empty squares along the floor and others staffed by demons. These are the player stores. If you find an empty one, you can open a store by spending 500 maka. After that, you choose an avatar for the shop and staff it with items, and you can go about your business, checking back with it to add more items or just shut down the shop entirely. If anything sells, the money is automatically sent to your on-screen mailbox. The publisher does well to involve the community in other ways as well. The most notable being the loading screens. Why I'd remark about loading screens seems baffling, but considering the game's screens are all fan art done by the community, it adds a nice touch, telling us the publisher seemed to care about its community. Or maybe it was just a one-off contest thing that I wasn't aware of. The only issue I have with this is the thing I feared from the first time I saw it. It's a really petty complaint, so feel free to call me out on it. The users' names are prominently displayed on the art, as you would expect, but it's just off-putting when you run into an art piece that's plastered with one of those names. You know, something like Goku Lover 12892 or X Wonder Boy X, or in the case of an actual example I'd seen, a lot of vagina. Yeah, I know the name is an Austin Powers reference. It doesn't matter. Shut up. Overall, a passionate community is usually a helpful one, especially in a niche title like this. I had no problem getting help with questions from other players most of the time, and despite the seemingly constant talking, mostly containing arguments, at least when it came down to playing, they'd actually be willing to play. Although I'm certain they're going to tear me apart for not getting past the first areas and yet still making this video. In the realm of redundancy, I will once again mention that the cash shop currency are the Atlas Crowns, which have a baffling exchange rate, starting with 3,500 crowns for $5, up to 70,000 crowns for $100. The shop is done quite differently. Sure, there's the standard cash shop item area where you can buy the things like mounts, XP boosters, XP protectors, more inventory slots, what have you. However, you might also notice AC items in the regular shops as well. This does bring about what seems to be a rather unfortunate implication of looking like a pay-to-win. Each AC equipment piece does have stats on it, and it's usually the best item in the shop. But only marginally so. It's not like you'll immediately become unstoppable by getting one. There are a lot nicer looking weapons, at least. At the very least, there are equivocal items in the shops, they just cost a lot of maka. Since you only have one character slot, and you know my pet peeve about limited character slots, a good purchase for a serious player would be another slot. I believe that buying a new slot with the right item will also allow you for some more customization options. Wow, this game is sounding more and more like Mobby Nogi by the minute. A serious warning though, if you buy a character ticket and delete the character later, it doesn't give you a free slot. You just lost that ticket. Think about that before you decide to buy. This game is a pretty tough sell for those who are used to the current MMO market, unless you've only played Mobi Nogi. With a weird control and combat system, there's a lot of people willing to dismiss this game altogether, but if you really start to wrap your head around the mechanics, there's a lot you can do, and it's a pretty involving experience, especially for the Shin Megami Tensei fan. Here's my final rating. Fans of the SMT series should have no problem fitting in here. The familiar art style, enemies, and story should all help make you feel right at home, unless you've only known the Persona series, but it's still close. 
With demon training and customizable character classes, the game is deep and involving, and with a lot of opportunities to create a character the way you'd want. If you don't like how simple MMOs have become as of recent, with newer games practically guiding you by the hand along your path to the max level, you might enjoy this much less linear experience. As I mentioned before, you have one character slot, so buying another might be a good idea if you're looking to build your character a different way without sacrificing your current one. Just be careful and know that if you delete that character for any reason, that character creation ticket is gone and you will have to buy a new one. The only other thing I can suggest is to get a bit of an edge early on by grabbing a few of the better boosting items, or at least keep an amount of Atlas Crowns around to self-res if you plan solo. Since this game's mechanics are explained quite confusingly, it might drive away a lot of new players. If that doesn't do the trick, the odd controls and combat system, or the very dangerous and frustratingly difficult enemies might do it. Since there's a lot of grinding to be done in order to improve, you really need to be dedicated to the game in order to advance and get anywhere decent. If you don't have the time, you might not want to try this one out. Yeah, this took way longer for something that I didn't get all that far into in the first place. Well, maybe next time I should look into slaying something that's a little less demonic. Like baby's first SMT! <laughs>